Now that you've tackled multiple alleles, codominance, and incomplete dominance, there's a range of other effects that result from genes interacting or proteins interacting. And one of the most interesting to me is pleiotropy. That's genes that affect more than one phenotype. So a single protein from a single gene could, for example, cause both the crossed eyes that you see in many Siamese cats, but also their point, um, point restricted coloration, where they have you know dark extremities but a light colored body, um, and. On an even more interesting note, there are genes out there that can influence both fur color or coat color and survival. Your very life depends on some of these genes, and those are known as lethal genes, and they fall under the umbrella of pleiotropy because they're, again, one gene affecting many phenotypes or many of those visible traits. And so how did we come about understanding pleiotropy. Well, one of the early experiments involved a gray mouse that they knew was a pure breeding mouse. It had come from a lineage of gray mice. And they crossed that with a yellow mice and they they found a one-to-one -one ratio of gray to yellow. So they assumed great. Now we know that's our test cross. We know the yellow mouse is heterozygous. That's how you would end up with one-to-one. -one. So that gray was recessive, yellow is dominant to the gray. There's the test cross that you could use to figure that out for the parents and the offspring here. And then they took those yellow offspring and they did a cross of them and they were expecting to see the Mendelian 3 to 1 ratio. Three yellow mice for every one gray mouse. And that's why. Was it 3 to 1? No, it was not three to one. It was actually two to one. And the way they explained that was they assumed that the homozygous dominant form was producing too much of a protein. So the protein was both turning the fur yellow, but it was also causing a lethal effect. And so the mice born were only the heterozygous and the homozygous recessive. So the only yellow mice you would ever see and count as you were figuring out these ratios would be yellow mice or the heterozygous yellow mice. So pleiotropy is when one gene affects many phenotypes but you can also have many genes affecting a single phenotype or a single trait. And so one common example of this is epistasis so that's what we're going to focus on here. But again, you have many genes now all contributing to one trait. And a, you know, we have this in eye color, we see it in skin colors. It is one of the many things that gives us the range, the continuous variation we see in populations is having many genes all blend into one trait and combine that way. But epistasis specifically is when one gene present in a certain form, be that homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, simply having a dominant allele there, but one gene out of the many genes contributing to this trait can knock out the effects of all the others. It is, it, it kind of masks or overshadows those effects. And so this can happen with albinism, but it also happens with coat color in Labradors. So we're going to talk about brown chocolate, or sorry, chocolate, black and yellow labs. So first of all, there's two genes at play here. There's the one for pigment coloration, and black is dominant to brown or chocolate. And you may say, where's the yellow? Well, the yellow comes in when you consider the gene for depositing the pigments in the fur. So dominant is the pigment is deposited there, and so you'll have a black or chocolate lab but recessive means that even though those pigments are circulating around in the cells, they're not going to actually get into the fur themselves. So you don't see the pigment. So it doesn't matter if you have dominant Bs or lowercase Bs. As long as you have two recessive Es for that one gene, the E gene, 
the pigment deposition gene, you're going to have a yellow lab. Black, all you need is a single dominant B, a single dominant E. The others could be either one, and you'll have a black lab. Chocolate labs, you have to have the recessive Bs and at least one dominant deposition, pigment deposition gene, and you'll have a chocolate lab. So I've got a question for you. I want you to show me how a yellow lab and a chocolate lab could have a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio of offspring, and that's black to chocolate to yellow. So pause again. Try to work this out on your own. But I'm going to go through it right now with you. So, first of all, we know our chocolate lab has to have two recessive B alleles and at least one dominant E allele. We also know that our yellow lab is going to have two recessive E alleles, but we're also showing a 50-50 ratio here of labs that have color and labs that are not depositing the color because we have a brown and a chocolate, so that's two and two yellow. So all of that points to a heterozygous crossed with a homozygous recessive. And so I've gone ahead and worked out the chocolate lab must be heterozygous because it has to contribute a lowercase e to have those yellow puppies. And both of its gametes, both ver uh, variations, will have recessive Bs because that is all it has to give to its offspring. And the yellow lab we know has lowercase e's, but we don't know what its b's are yet. And so we're going to figure that out. And so if we write in all the things we know, we at least have found our two yellow labs. Those must be the two yellow labs. And then we know the other two must be black and brown. So fill in the b that's needed for brown and for black labs or chocolate and black labs there and then just work backwards. So that must be the B that matches the possible gamete. So we have a lowercase b and an e and an uppercase b and a lowercase e and combine those back together into a parent genotype and there is the genotype of our yellow lab. And so that's it for epistasis. You just have to remember that I'm only showing you epistasis that results from homozygous recessive genes, but there's a whole lot of other variations out there. Whenever you see one gene overwhelming the effects of other genes that it's interacting with to produce one trait, you're looking at some sort of epistasis. But epistasis and multiple alleles are really not the only reason we have all this continuous variation. Um, the shapes, the sizes, the colors we see in population um, are both the, rea um, the interaction of genes and the environment. So that's my parting words to you in this podcast is don't forget that the environment plays a role too. Eating a nutrient-rich or a nutrient-poor diet can affect height, it can affect strength, training can affect strength and endurance and your lung capacity and so many things. Um, you have the effects of temperature on enzymes also, so that some enzymes produced are inactive at warm temperatures. So that's why you see the little point restricted, so the cute rabbits with the black ears and the black tail and the black feet because they're cold versus, you know, the rest of the body is white because the pigment is not deposited in those, or the, the enzyme causing the black pigment is not active in those warmer parts of the body. Um, all of those things are the interaction of the environment on genes. So we've got a lot more going on here than we're talking about, but you've got a nice foundation now in the things that cause variation in populations and some of the patterns you can use to predict.